In this section, we shall cover the basics of the topic, risk-informed wash resilience. Once you have successfully completed this topic, you should be able to do the following. First, describe the concept of risk, its different definitions and levels of risk assessment. Second, explain the different formulas used to assess risk. Third, use risk assessment to inform a resilience strategy. A quick reminder of where we are in the entire course. We are within the context of understanding the problem. There, we are within the subsection of assessing relevant risks to the wash services and setting the rationale for the resilience strategy. Assess relevant risks to the wash services and set the rationale for the resilience strategy. We are going to cover this topic in three steps. First, we are going to identify the risk we are going to look at concepts like subject and object of different risks and how they help us to understand risk assessment better. Then we are going to do the risk assessment and prioritization. In this lesson, we are using so-called probability and impact framework to do this. We are going to learn that different kinds of risk events have various levels of impact requiring diverse actions to address them in a resilience strategy. Once we have prioritized, we select risk events to look at them in a little bit more detail. We look at how a risk event fits within causal chains. For example, what causes the risk event or its causality? And then what are the impacts of the risk event? what will happen as a consequence of the risk event. Understanding causes and effects help us to identify possible actions to mitigate or manage the risk. For a moment, let's take a step back and discuss what the term risk means to you. This is not so much about technical examples, but your general life experience. Give two examples of things that you consider as risks. For the moment, please write them down on a piece of paper. Later, you will be able to complete them in an online quiz. Going through diverse sources, you will invariably encounter different definitions of risk. This is inevitable, as people look at it from different angles. We shall go through some examples of these definitions. In the beginning, this might confuse you somewhat. You may wonder why we discuss all these different definitions. The goal here is to understand while there are a variety of different definitions out there, they all point to the same general concept. For example, first let's look at the domain of climate and disaster risk. UNISDR defines risk as the potential loss of life injury or destroyed or damaged assets which could occur to a system, society or a community in a specific period of time determined probabilistically as a function of hazard, exposure, vulnerability and capacity. A long definition. The UNICEF's guidance document on risk-informed programming known as GRIP defines risk as follows. The likelihood of shocks or stresses and their negative consequences leading to the erosion of development progress, the deepening of deprivation and or humanitarian crisis affecting children or vulnerable households and groups. Keeping those complex definitions of risk aside for a moment, let's look at the concept in plain language. A risk is a potential harm. The word potential here is important. We don't use the term risk to an event that has already taken place. Therefore, we always describe risk using probabilistic terms. What are the common terms in various definitions of risk? Events. 
something that happens or take place especially one of importance hazard a source of danger that can cause harm impact or consequences what is the magnitude of harm or something undesirable objective what are the goals we are trying to achieve in a certain system or service which will be impacted by a risk event probability or likelihood this is the extent to which some such harmful event is likely to happen let's look at the definition of risk using a somewhat different domain in project management risk is defined as an uncertain event or condition that if it occurs has a positive or negative effect on the project's objectives they talk about both positive and negative impacts here but what we generally worry about is the negative effects infrastructure asset management is the discipline where we focus on the optimal service delivery and sustainability of different infrastructure systems asset management defines risk as follows the measure of the likelihood that a harmful incident will occur and the consequence if it does so we combine the likelihood or the probability of an event and its consequence to define risk here in the context of climate change risk is defined as the potential for adverse consequences for human or ecological systems to clarify the concept of risk further it can be helpful to identify the object that is potentially under threat and the subject that is acting on the object to cause the threat let us try to understand this with some examples a subject of risk can be an external event risk caused by cyclones high rainfall events or droughts are examples or it could be internal failures in infrastructure asset management we commonly look at risk driven by internal component failures a failure of a component for instance a pump in the water supply system impacts the system's function and its service delivery the object is the entity that suffers from the risk it could be vulnerable groups it could be a program or a project or it could be a certain community like a village or a refugee camp and it could also be actors in a geographical domain or in an infrastructure service for example consumers of a water supply system the grip document gives specific examples of objects related to the unicef's organization and activities children the program in a country or the entire enterprise or a part of a system it is useful to give a quantitative value for risk this helps us to establish the potential for harm or the level of urgency to avoid that harm let's take an example This is a hazard map. The colors superimposed on the map shows the depth of flood water or inundation depth due to a certain flood event. In this case, it is an event that has a likelihood of occurring once in 100 years. Knowing the depth of the flood and what type of properties or people are exposed to it we can estimate what is the potential damage caused by the flood this is the quantified risk in this example it is the damage estimated in monetary terms us dollars per square meter it can be other harms like increase of disease burden or the number of casualties as well 
We remember the UNISDR's definition of the risk. Putting it into a sort of an equation, we can say risk equals hazard multiplied by exposure multiplied by vulnerability. The European Union's Disaster Risk Management Knowledge Centre has developed the INFORM methodology for risk assessment. They transform the definition into a slightly different form. INFORM lumps hazard and exposure into a single term, then the vulnerability and lack of coping capacity next to it. Before we go further into the quantification of risk, let's introduce a hypothetical scenario. A flood in a refugee camp. Let's assume the following. A flood event covering most of the camp area with 1 meter high water level. So that is the event we are considering in this example. The estimated probability is this event happening once in 20 years, let's say. So that means we can convert it into an annual probability of 1 in 20 or 5 percent. Then let's see there are two types of dwellings in the refugee camp. Those made of concrete, so obviously these are less vulnerable to the flood damage, and mud huts, which are much more vulnerable to the flood. And let's also say that the total estimated damage for the whole refugee camp from this particular flood event is estimated at 200,000 US dollars. Finally, there is an adjacent camp which is not flooding and it has vacancies. So, in the case of a flood, it is possible for the authorities to relocate the inhabitants of the damaged houses to this other camp. There are many somewhat overlapping and hence confusing definitions of risk. It is the same concept but different authorities and sources use slightly different, sometimes overlapping, terms to define risk. The following diagram might help you to disentangle these. The most basic definition is the multiplication of probability and consequence to obtain risk. Let us take the example of the flood event inundating the refugee camp to a depth exceeding 1 meter. So here we define our event. We assume the probability of this happening in a given year to be 5%. The total monetary value of damage of this particular event is established at 200,000 US dollars. Then we can estimate the risk using these two points of data. In monetary terms, the risk is 200,000 US dollars multiplied by 5% probability, which is 10,000 US dollars per year. Some others expand the consequence as the interplay between exposure and the vulnerability. In our example, we can argue that the exposure is human and ecosystems being in contact with the flood. So that a one meter high flood event can define exposure of our system into the flood event. Then what is the vulnerability? Let's assume the camp has two types of shelters, those made of concrete and mud huts. The same flood, same exposure, will cause more damage to the mud huts as they are more vulnerable uh, to the flood waters. So that is why sometimes it's useful to separate vulnerability and exposure because the same exposure can cause different levels of risk depending on the vulnerability of the object that is exposed to that risk event. Sometimes we can combine probability with exposure. That is, we calculate what is the probability of certain 
event happening and then what is the exposure that event will cause. Uh, for example, in our flood event, we can say that there is a 5% probability and the flood event is going to be 1 meter high in most places of our camp. Together, this is called hazard. And then the social or ecological systems that are facing to this hazard has certain vulnerabilities. When you combine that hazard with vulnerability, that defines risk. So hopefully, by looking at this diagram, you might have been able to disentangle the various risk definitions. In the UNICEF's GRIP document, hazard is broken down into two terms. First, hazard shock or stress and then its exposure separately. By doing this, GRIP explicitly separate the hazard event and the exposure of social or ecological systems, for example, vulnerable communities. We also break down the term vulnerability explicitly into the system's vulnerability and its capacity to deal with it. We can either have lack of capacity on the numerator or capacity in the denominator. Both of them mean the same thing. Let us look at the risk definition using hazard, exposure, vulnerability and capacity in a bit more detail. Let's use the same example of the flood in the refugee camp. The hazard shock or stress is a flood event with a specified magnitude, 1 meter flood depth and a certain likelihood 5% chance in a year. Both those information are important when specifying a hazard. Then there is exposure. Now the fact that this flood happened in the refugee camp as opposed to say a grassland causes it to create a certain level of damage. This is exposure. Then the vulnerability. In our example, we are focusing on the property damage and its consequences. So the vulnerability here is defined by the types of dwellings in this refugee camp, concrete and mud huts. Mud huts are much more vulnerable compared to the concrete dwellings in this case. Then finally, the capacity. What is the level of ability available to deal with this event? In our example, we have the possibility of relocation. So, there is a capacity in a positive sense. So, that will reduce our total risk. How do we assess risk using risk equation 1? The first step is to identify the context, then define the scope and gather the relevant data. Then we identify different hazard events, exposure and vulnerability. After that, we can combine those to assess the risk as hazard multiplied by exposure multiplied by vulnerability. Remember that risk is probabilistic. Often our knowledge of it will be incomplete. This is denoted by a confidence score. We also look at the capacities or lack of them to deal with each risk event. Finally, we prioritize the way we manage the risk. How to quantify risk using risk equation version 1 to rank different risks? First, we need a rating scale. In this case, we use a three point scale one for low, two for medium and 3 for high. We start by listing all the important hazards, for example, flooding, fluoride in drinking water, political stability and so on. Then we score each of these hazard events. Here remembering the hazard has a magnitude and probability, we need to consider both those when scoring. A word of caution here. 
Remember, we are scoring the hazard only at this stage. Do not mix attributes related to exposure and vulnerability to influence your score here. For example, look at the last row. Let us say that the environment is highly vulnerable to desertification. However, that fact should not affect your scoring of the hazard that is desertification. The fact of the environment is related to the vulnerability. Then we score exposure. Latrines are highly exposed to flooding, for, uh, for example. So we have scored it 3. Finally, we score vulnerabilities. What are the vulnerabilities of the system we are considering? For example, financial difficulties make people somewhat vulnerable to the exposure of latrines to floods. Here a medium score is given. Finally, we multiply these scores together horizontally to come up with a risk score. So depending on the value of the risk score, we can rank risk to prioritize them. As was stated earlier, when scoring is done, it is very important to strictly focus on hazard, exposure and vulnerability individually and separately. Sometimes we tend to mix them. For example, knowing that environment is highly vulnerable to desertification, we may score desertification hazard as high. But this is wrong. When scoring the hazard, we should only focus on the magnitude and probability that defines the hazard. You may also note that certain hazard events, for example flooding, have been listed more than once in this table. This is because it may trigger different exposures and vulnerabilities. In this example, flooding exposes latrines as well as wells. Further. Exposure of latrines to flooding relates to both financial and physical vulnerabilities. After ranking and selecting a subset of highest ranking risks, the next steps are giving them a confidence score, assessing capacity against those risks, and then finally prioritize them for addressing. These steps are beyond the scope of this introductory lesson. Please refer to the WASH Climate Resilient Development document for those details. Here's another short exercise for you. Please fill in the blanks on a piece of paper for the moment. Later you will be able to fill your answers in an online quiz. Here is the version 2 of the risk equation. Risk equals the likelihood of a risk event multiplied by its probable impact. This is very similar to the probability multiplied by the consequence idea that we encountered earlier. The GRIP document uses this version 2 predominantly. Let us look at the risk equation version 2 once again. Risk equals likelihood multiplied by probable impact. Now where is the magnitude of the risk event or the hazard? It seems that this equation does not contain it explicitly. What is going on? When we identify the hazard event for a risk assessment, it is very important to attach a magnitude to that event. Otherwise it's not specific, so have little meaning. For example, Take flood. If you just specify it as flood, quote unquote, it can mean host of different things. For example, it could be a very small flood that does not impact your system at all. On the other extreme, it could be a catastrophic flood event that will inundate the whole system as well as the serving community. It can be anything in between. So. When doing a risk assessment, it is important to identify the hazard event with a specific magnitude. Let us look at some more examples. Flood of at least 
about the bank level. So that is the magnitude statement. It says that the flood at least reaches about the level of the river bank. So it gives some idea about the magnitude of the event. Flood submerging the boreholes. That is also implicitly a magnitude statement because the flood has to rise to a certain level to cover our boreholes. Flood inundating more than 50% of the camp area. Flood that causes at least 1 meter inundation in the most of the camp area. These are also examples of magnitude statements. A flood covering the whole cultivated area lasting at least for seven days. For agriculture, the, the duration of the flood, I guess, is more important to assess the damage than the exact level of inundation. So in this particular example, we use the duration as our magnitude statement. Here is a different one. A flood that occurs once in 10 years. This is a bit more complex. In engineering, we often, often relate magnitude to frequency or likelihood. For example, once in 100 years flood has a certain magnitude or certain flood height. And one in 10 year flood has a smaller magnitude than that. In fact, this is the reason why we just have likelihood in our risk equation. It implicitly specify a magnitude in most cases. Let us look at the idea of the risk matrix. We know that risk increases with both the likelihood and the impact of an event. Traditionally, we use so-called risk matrix to combine these two variables. Here, x-axis is the likelihood ranging from very unlikely to happen to very likely to happen and y-axis is the severity or impact of the event. It ranges from superficial to catastrophic in this case. Now, combining these two using equation two, we can calculate the risk. You would agree that these color codes make sense. The red color towards the top right corner depicting high risk and green color towards bottom left corner indicating low risk. In between, diagonally, we have orange color to denote a moderate level of risk. This is a very useful representation to understand the magnitude of the risk. However, the color coding does not tell the whole story. For that, I want us to look at another representation of the same risk matrix like this. Top right and bottom left are high and low risk respectively. Let's focus on the diagonal or the orange area earlier. On the top left and the bottom right, risk values may be very similar. For example, likelihood of 1% in a given year and the impact of 100,000 euros damage will give the expected risk value of 1,000 euros in a given year. In another case, a likelihood of an event happening about 10 times in one year but the impact is just 100 euros per event. That also will result in the risk value of 1000 euros in a given year. But these risks are very different in nature. On the bottom right, we look at very frequent events, but when they happen, their impact is low, so the risk is moderate. On the top left, we have risk events where the probability of happening is very, very small. But when it happens, the impact is extremely high. So again, the multiple gives a moderate value of risk. So I'm sure you would agree that these are very different kinds of risk events, even though they might receive the same risk score. When we are building a resilience strategy, we need to manage these risks differently. Here is a little 
exercise for you to reinforce your learning on the risk equation version 2. Using the words that are given below, please fill in the blanks. You may write down the answers in a piece of paper for the moment. Later you will get the opportunity to upload them in an online quiz. Let us look at how we analyze the causes and impacts of certain risk or a risk event. Let's take the example of water supply system where the risk event we are considering now is the pump stoppage. So your pumping would stop due to some reason. First we look at the reasons that might have caused the pump to stop. Some examples are flooding of the pumping station, low water level or disruption of electrical power. Then let us look at the impact of pump stoppage. What happens after or as a consequence of the event? It may cause water supply disruption, permanent damage to pumps or damage to pipes due to sudden hydraulic surge. Understanding the causes and impacts clearly can help us to manage the risk effectively. For example, we can overcome the pump stoppage due to electricity disruption by having a backup generator in place. We can reduce the impact of pump stoppage on water supply disruption by having a large enough water storage so that we can use it until the pumps are back online. This method is called the bowtie diagram. We usually do not stop at one level of causes or impacts, but look at chains of events. For example, a flood can cause pump to stop. What causes the flood is our next question. We do the same for the impacts. Such detailed analysis is beyond the scope of this lesson, but we have given you some references. How can the risk analysis inform the resilience strategy depends on the nature of the risk. We can take one or more actions to mitigate or manage it. This set of actions will inform our resilience strategy. Some examples for actions could be avoidance, act to stop the risk from happening, contingency, Allow the risk to happen but absorb the impact. An example of avoidance could be that the community is going to get flooded. So we create an embankment between the community and the river so that flooding will not impact the community. In the same example, we can take uh, contingency measures. Say the impact of flooding is not catastrophic. So we let the area to flood once in a while, but when the flood happens, we have locations for effective evacuation. So that is a contingency measure. Mitigation. Reduce the probability that risk will happen or minimize the impact if it does. So it can be a combination of both addressing the cause and addressing the impact. Monitoring is one of the mitigation strategies. Let's say that we have a river level system upstream. So we get sufficient warning about high water level so that we can evacuate the community in time for a flood event. Take no action. Sometimes risk can be bearable and small. Then we make a conscious decision not to take any action at all. That is also a legitimate part of a resilient strategy. For example, let's say a refugee camp is getting flooded once in a while. Let's say once in several years, but the impact is so small compared to the other problems we have to deal with. So we don't take any action about that flooding. It's a nuisance, but we live with that. Finally, transfer. Get someone else to take as much of the risk as possible. A great example of this is taking out insurance. 
how to select risk management strategies. For this, we use our risk matrix again. In the diagram, let us represent each of our risk events as dots. Let us look at several examples. On the top right corner, we have the region which depicts unacceptably high risk. We must employ a strategy like avoidance or mitigation for that. Then we have the other extreme that is very low risk as a result of combination of low likelihood and low impact. For this, we can decide to do nothing. Then the top left, we have a moderate risk that is driven by high impact. So while this is a moderate risk, the likelihood of that happening is low, the impact is high. We often implement certain monitoring and warning mechanisms and preparedness for this kind of risk. Simply because the impact can be very high. We have moderate risks that are driven by high likelihood on the bottom right. In this area, we usually look at the cost of addressing the risk. What is the cost of mitigating the risk? How much risk is reduced from that action? So we balance these two usually to decide whether we should intervene or how to intervene. Sometimes we may decide to transfer these risks or take contingency measures and sometimes even to do nothing. Let us take the example of a flood. Risk related to different flood events and their consequences can be very different. First, let's say it is very likely that a big river flood happens causing a high inundation level and potential loss of life. This is an unacceptable level of risk and we need to act urgently. The second example, there can be a small flood whenever it rains. While it floods very frequently because of the very small inundation depths, there is no loss of life but a nuisance and a potential minor health risk. Here we have to make a decision. Okay, does it make sense to do something about it? How much effort or cost is needed to do that something? How much will it reduce the risk? We estimate these things and try to make a sort of cost-benefit based decision. When the moderate risk is impact driven, for example, the camp is protected from a river flood by an embankment or a dike. It is very unlikely for the dike to fail, but if it does, the consequence can be catastrophic. For example, human lives can be lost. In this case, we usually go for monitoring and contingency measures. Routine monitoring of the embankment's condition may be warranted, for example. Low risk. Once in several years, when we get unusually high rain, we experience some very small scale floods. We may decide to do nothing in this case. Let us summarize what we have learned. We learned that there are many and oftentimes confusing definitions of risk. But once we disentangle them and understand, they all illustrate the same concept. We learn the basics of using hazard, exposure, vulnerability and capacity formulation for risk assessment. Also, we learn to use the likelihood and impact formula, which is called version 2 of the risk equation, to do the risk assessment. We learn how to use a risk matrix to identify possible actions for risk management and identify the causes and impact of those events. Finally, here are some references for you to get further information. I thank you.